Good morning, everybody. Welcome once again to our special family service today. And today, again, we're going to have some interesting things to show you with uh, with one or two of my friends. And also today, a very exciting story about a very famous athlete. Because as you will be aware, this week or yesterday, last couple of days, has started the Olympic Games. And that's what people have been looking forward to for the last two years. You may know, of course, it was cancelled last year and it was nearly cancelled this year, right at the very last minute. I must admit, I felt for those athletes who have been practicing for years, wondering whether or not they were going to be able to compete and be able to do what they have been working for for so long. Well, fortunately for the majority, it has happened, despite the fact that the spectators aren't there to, to look and see and cheer. But uh, maybe you're one of those who are going to be cheering from your armchair and looking on. Must be quite interesting. Can you imagine there you are in the Olympic sports and you're looking around for the crowds and there's no crowds. There's almost like, where are they? And yet there are millions of people watching you, tens of millions of people, even though you don't see them. And I was thinking that's how sometimes it can be. We are here on earth. We have to live a life for the Lord Jesus, a life for God, because God has us here for a special purpose. And it's almost though we don't recognize it. We are surrounded by a noble company of angels. We don't see them. And God's angels there are cheering us on. They're cheering us on. We don't see them. There's an illustration of that in the Bible when we speak about Elisha the prophet. Elisha the prophet, uh, the king had sent some armies to attack him and capture him because um, he didn't like him, what he was doing. And Elisha's servant was there when the king sent the soldiers to arrest them. And he was very scared. And then Elisha prayed and says, Lord, open my servant's eyes. And then he saw there in the unseen realm, there were angels and chariots of fire and the splendor of God's power and might and majesty and immediately all his fear was gone and if we can only and that's what we can pray just now as we begin today or to open our eyes and see that the lord is with us that there are more with us than he that is in this world yes so we cannot see the invisible realm not very very often but yet God wants us to be aware that he is with us. And as Mickey will tell us in a moment, he will never leave us. So there we go. So let's just pray and then we'll go into our meeting. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are with us. Thank you, Lord, that you'll never leave us. And though we do not see you with our physical eyes, yet we know by faith, that you are truly with us, that your heavenly host, the armies of heaven are with us, that you say you send your angels to watch over us. And so, Lord, we worship you today. We thank you for your presence. And we thank you, Lord, that, Lord, you're watching over us in all that we do. So we give you thanks and ask your blessing on today's meeting. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining us. And yes, of course, we always have, as we have here. Say hi, Mickey. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Yes, I was listening to Mike then, and this is so true. That's why I want you to know, just as we normally do. Can, can you just put your hand up a minute like this? Put your hand up, please, if that's okay. And this is the promise from the Lord Jesus. Remember the promise that Jesus says, I will never leave. You, yeah. Okay. Have you got anybody to to be with us, Mickey, to have a look? Oh yes, I've got my friend Chester. He wanted to come along. Chester, I don't know if we've seen Chester for a while. No, no, he's here. He's here. Yeah. 
I'll go and get him. Okay, then you go and get Chester. Where's Chester? And while we're getting Chester, oh, I think he's coming. While we're getting Chester, let's have, because thinking a bit about the Olympics today, because we're going to hear that amazing story of a man called Eric Little. And you know, this Olympics, I was listening, there are at least two Christian athletes who are running in the Olympic Games. If I get chance, I might just show you at the end, if I get chance, who those uh, Olympic athletes are. And uh, we can want to cheer for them as they're running. And as they said, running the race best we can, but also the first one in our lives is the Lord Jesus. And we're running to please him. And that's the story of the famous athlete that we'll look in today who ran in the 1924 Olympics. OK, so just before Chester comes along, let's do our song and. Uh, I was having a little technical trouble just before we came on air, but hopefully it's solved. But I have to do it like this. As we say, I'm just getting my songs up and uh, I had to. Oh, that's the wrong. That's the wrong screen. See, so. Where have they gone? The songs. Ah, here we are. And uh, this is you may not know this one. But it's a great one I was thinking of when we're thinking of the Olympics and running a race. And I know we all like running. If we're getting a bit older, it's not quite as easy to run. Sometimes the only running we're doing is if we're running for a bus or something like that. But uh, if you're younger, it's great to be able to have the freedom to run. And if you're in school, to run in the different races. And uh, maybe some of you are going to be famous athletes um, but this is the song and it goes it goes i'm going to run 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 to meet my jesus i'm going to run 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 to meet my jesus i'm going to run 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 to meet my jesus when he comes hallelujah when he comes and then we sing every eye Shall then behold him, every eye shall then behold him, every eye shall then behold him when he comes, hallelujah, when he comes. And chorus again, I'm going to run, run, run to meet my Jesus. I'm going to run, run, run to meet my Jesus. I'm going to run, run, run to meet my Jesus. When he comes, hallelujah, when he comes. And then, and this is why we, many of us don't like it, the fact when people are bowing the knee, because the Bible tells us to bow our knee before the Lord Jesus and him alone. So it goes, every knee shall bow before him. Every knee shall bow before him. Every knee shall bow before him. When he comes, hallelujah, when he comes, the chorus. I'm going to run, run, run to meet my Jesus. I'm going to run, run, run to meet my Jesus. I'm going to run, run, run to meet my Jesus. When he comes, hallelujah, when he comes. And when he comes, the Bible talks about his being caught up, rising the air. And so we sing, I'm going to rise 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 to meet my jesus i'm going to rise 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 to meet my jesus i'm going to rise 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 to meet my jesus when he comes hallelujah when he comes and the last time i'm going to run 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 to meet my jesus i'm gonna run 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 to meet my jesus i'm going to run Run, run to meet my Jesus when he comes. Hallelujah, when he comes. That's a different one, that. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is coming and he's coming soon. And he's shown us lots of different things, how we can expect Jesus to come at any time. 
And so the Bible tells us to be ready. It's not too sure just when exactly he can come. But he says, when you see the different things that are happening in our world, as we see them today, he says, no, I am very close to coming. And when he comes, oh, how wonderful it's going to be. It's so incredibly exciting. And I'm looking forward to that day. OK, so here he is, my friend Chester. Come on, Chester. And now Chester, he actually doesn't like saying very much because he likes to keep things hidden inside him. Here's Chester. Say hello, Chester. Hello, everybody. Yes. I know he's a bit of a grump because, as I said, he doesn't really like opening his mouth because Chester holds something very, very precious inside. Would you like to see? Yes? Chester, will you open your mouth? What? No, no one's going to steal. <laughs> and he can't do that, Chester, because they'd have to put their hand through the screen. And as yet, they can't do that. No, no, that's all right. And there are people there, though you can't see them. Yes, I think there's one or two folks there. Yes, yes, Mrs. You know, there, can you see? What? Yes, you just see a wee light. Yes, I know that's a light, but there are what there are people behind that that that, that light. Well, maybe maybe there's at least one. Hopefully. <laughs> okay. All right then, Chester. So I want you to open your mouth and let's have a look because. Chester carries something very precious. Go on then, Chester. Open your mouth and go on. Wow. Can you see what's inside Chester? There he's holding some very, very precious jewels. There's a ruby, diamond, emerald. Uh, sapphire beautiful beautiful jewels chester why do you have these ah well the bible says well chester says he's hiding these jewels can i take one out okay let me just take one out i'll take out this one uh-huh this is a ruby. Let's just take up the oh and it's all right, Chester. When I take one, I'll just like pull in the teeth. Have you have your teeth? Pull up. Anyway, let's go on, there you go. Yeah. Oh Chester, why do you have this ruby? Uh huh. Okay. Well, you see, this particular stone reminds us of because what's the color the color is red and it reminds us the most precious precious thing really when we say well the most precious substance because uh, in, in the universe and what's that that we call it the precious blood of the lord jesus and this ruby reminds us that the lord jesus on the cross poured out his precious blood so we can be forgiven for all the things we have done wrong. That's why Chester has it. Okay, well, we'll not do that just now, Chester, because, yeah, what we'll do each week for the next couple of weeks or so, I'm going to show you one of these different stones and just explain just a little bit, like the ruby shows us, of course, as we told you about the precious blood. But with these stones, I just say they're hidden, they're precious jewels. And what the Bible teaches is this, is that God is making you and I like his precious jewels. And that day when he's coming, the Bible speaks about on that day, he is making up his precious jewels. Those people, a jewel is formed by lots of testing in the depths of the earth and co they come through a, a, it's, it's amazing how the jewels are actually made and but they are so precious and god is making you and i like a precious jewel and it says that when we talk about jesus he comes 
and he listens. And as we seek to serve him and honour him, he is like causing our, our life to become like a jewel, something very, very precious and special. And one day when Jesus comes back again, it's going to be like Chester opening his mouth and showing his jewels. He is going to show how you and I are one of his jewels because you have followed Jesus and spoke about him. And really, that's a little secret that God really wants us to know, that he is making you, even though sometimes it's hard. And, you know, an athlete trains hard. It's really hard. They haven't got to give up. And they train as we were for the Olympics for many years to be able to even run the race. And then when they achieve the goal and they win a medal, wow, it's incredible. And the Bible tells us following or being a Christian is like a race. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of commitment. And as we're going to hear today in our, our Bible story later on, sometimes we can get a bit down. And there's great times of achievement and joy, but sometimes we can get a bit down. And one of God's very precious servants, a very famous man, he did a tremendous thing. And then he got very discouraged and nearly gave up. So that's the last thing that God wants us to do is to give up. Never give up. OK, so we're going to have another song and then we're going to hear about this famous athlete. So let's just have, whoops, go back into the screen and we'll have another song. If I can just remove that one for a moment. <clears throat> and uh, I had these out and but as I said, there was a technical hitch. So what I wanted, to, the other one I wanted to do was, is it there? Here it is. It's an adventure. Hopefully this will come on. And I'll get one of my friends to come along and sing it with us. Are you right now? Oh, well, here's Fred. We'll do that one in a minute. This is one of my favourites. One of your favourites too, Fred. Yeah, yeah, one of my favourites. Oh, here's Fred. Say hi. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Hope you're having a good day. Yep. OK, we're going to do It's an Adventure. I'll just do the la-la bit first. It needs to go like this. La 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 Okay, I'll do it first and we get back. It's an adventure following Jesus. It's an adventure learning of him. It's an adventure living for Jesus. It's an adventure following him. Let's go where he leads us. Turn away from wrong. For we know we can trust him, yes, to help us as we go along. La 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 Thank you, Fred. It's an adventure following Jesus. It's an adventure learning of him. It's an adventure living for Jesus. It's an adventure following him. Let's go where he leads us. Turn away from wrong. For we know we can trust him to help us as we go along. <coughs> La 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 Okay, that's good. So we're going to go now into our story of this famous athlete and i'll get him here on the screen whoopsie daisy let me see so we get it right and uh, there we go now one day in fact it was just 
under 100 years ago, 1923. Today is 2021. And in 1923, there was to be this special race. It was a race that was taking place in England. It was what they call a triangular country, a country race at a place called Stoke-on-Trent. Oops, I just haven't got the actual picture there. Okay. And it was a race with these runners. And one of them was a boy uh, who was a blonde person. And his name was Eric Little. And for about two years, he'd been running races. And he had been quite fast, but on this particular race, as the race began and the runners began to race, Eric was not over. He was not over in the race. And it was like he was out of the race right at the very beginning. But the thing was, he got himself up. And though people were running far ahead of him, he began to run. And everybody in the stand was amazed because he began to catch up. So there was the one who was at the back and then he passed them and he passed another, passed another. And as he was getting near the line, suddenly with a with a, a boost of strength and energy, he, he won, he won. And all the crowd erupted. They thought, that's incredible. That's who is this person? And as I said, they began to say, who is this man? And he was called, of course, Eric Liddell. Well, as a result of that race, and different others, he was chosen to go into the Olympics the following year in 1924. And so Eric, he was very good at the 400 meetings and also at the 100 meters. And as he was chosen, he began to uh, practice running of course, he lot, as we said, there's a lot of discipline when you're practicing races. And he did his best to be the best he could be. Well, people thought at least he could win one gold medal in the 100 meters because that's what he was good at. Well, then one day, as he was finished practicing sprints, a friend waved a piece of paper at him like this. And he said, look, Eric. The timetable is out for the Olympic Games. Have you seen it? No. Eric glanced at his friend's face and he picked up the schedule. Then he took a deep breath. The tryouts for the race were scheduled for a Sunday. And he said, I won't run. Not on a Sunday. You see, Eric was him, Sunday was a day for worship. He had made a promise to God he would put, well, he put God first in all of his life. But on a Sunday, he would seek to serve him, go to worship, go to praise, uh, to go to church. And uh, he says, no, I can't run on a Sunday. That was his principle. Because on a Sunday, as we said, he wanted to get to the house of worship, to praise God, to worship God. and so he refused to run a race on a Sunday. Now, today in our Olympics, you see many people making stands and for many different things. But in those days, what Eric did was so incredible, unusual, that he was making a stand to honour God because he believed himself that uh, you're six days for work and then you have a day set aside. Um, to worship God and so he wouldn't he wouldn't shift and people began to argue with him and plead with him they said look God wants you to do this even the Prince of Wales came and tried to persuade him and people then began to criticize him because they thought he's going to let the country down people want a gold medal but he wouldn't do it all the athletic athletes fussed about him the newspapers spoke about him but Eric, he ignored them. He had made this choice to put God first. And so he continued to practice in for the other races. And because he was fast in the others, he was also chosen for the other race. He um, 
began to race in the 400 meters and the trials and and he, he began to get chosen and elected elected for the actual final now he actually uh, also ran in the 200 meters in the wednesdays of the olympic games he actually won a bronze there and he came in third but the 400 meters was set for uh, friday and he was chosen in the race to run in the outside lane and as he was there in the outside lane waiting for the starter's pistol a man came to him a canadian man apparently he was from the and uh, but it was a christian man and he handed him this bit of paper and when you opened it he saw these verses from the scripture where god says those who honor me i will honor and this person had felt to encourage eric as he had put god first in his life and was honoring him so god was going to honor him now this race was for six of them and no one was really expecting eric to do that well and of course he was in the hardest position in the outside lane which was very difficult um, so the starter's pistol went and they all shot off and eric began to run and he continued running and it was almost like uh, well he was just so empowered to run um one of the things that eric had said all of us are made is special but god had given this gift of running fast and so he ran and as he got near the finishing line people couldn't catch him he held his arms out and he managed incredibly to win the race and everyone there's a picture actually that's the actual picture of Eric Little winning that race and winning the Olympics in 1924. Of course, he became a hero. He became famous. Everybody wanted to know about him, whereas before people were criticizing him for his stand. Now they were honoring that uh, for his stand. And people wanted to listen to him and eric he wasn't a really good preacher as some preachers are but people saw that he was very faithful he was very sincere he was a man who could be trusted and honored so they came to listen to him and he spoke about his faith how he was brought up in initially born in china and with his missionary parents and how they had taught him the word of god and he began to explain his faith to many, many people. And many people began to trust the Lord Jesus because of Eric Stan. They saw he was sincere in what he did. He wasn't just speaking words. You know, the Bible tells us sometimes people say they're Christians, but they don't live as Christians. Whereas Eric Little, he sought as much as he could. Obviously, we all have our failures, but he, he, he as much as he could he sought to put god first in his life so he became very famous and then not long after that in the midst of his fame he stood up to the people and he said it was at a, a victory dinner and i'm just reading the words here in a victory dinner in his honor he astonished many people and he says now he says i'm going to be a missionary in china what again people were so upset because you, know, you can be a missionary here you can run your races you can great fame for the great britain but and and many people can trust trust god through you don't go to china we don't we need you here but he knew what god had called him to do and fame wasn't something that he was really interested in him. Yes, he wanted to do his best. He wanted to serve the country, but his greater calling was to serve God. And he knew where God wanted him to go. So he told them he was going to go to China. Well, 
though he would, people tried to persuade him not to. A few months later, a crowd gathered to come to the station to see Erikon as he went, and he went into northern parts of China, where he began to work in a, a, a Chinese college in the city of Chezin. And there he became a teacher, he taught science and English, but he also held weekly Bible studies. And also, he was given the authority to train people for races as well. So, he would still find time to run, and but also he was able to teach others as well. And then, a real blessing happened to him. He met a family called the Mackenzies, and their daughter was a lady called Florence, and he, she was playing the piano, and he liked her, and they began to talk together, and they decided that after Florence had completed her studies, then they would get married. Now, so after Florence had done the training, they got married, but Eric, he spent his time seeking God all the time. The secret of his success, as he said, was that he spent his time with the Lord. Every day he would spend time reading his Bible and praying. And of course, as we sometimes sing that chorus, read your Bible, pray every day. It's just such an important thing to do, is to spend time every day with the Lord. And then what he did, he began to, with his brother, who was also out there, he began to go to lots of the different homes. And because his heart, it was so sad when he saw that the people would worship idols like this, as you see and bow down before them. And one day he was in a, a house of a Chinese lady and he noticed the image of a kitchen god on the wall and he asked about it. And the lady says, this picture is changed every new year. We burn the old picture, then after we have rubbed, and after we rub the god's mouth with sugar. Oh, why do you do that? said Eric. And the woman answered very meaningfully. She said, we must make sure it will say only sweet words about us to the rulers in heaven. So Eric knew that false gods could never help the suffering people of China. And, of course, the Bible tells us that the true God said he shall have no other gods before me. And so he longed to tell the people more and more about the Lord Jesus and about the true God who sent Jesus to come and to die for us. And so Eric then, with another Chinese friend, they began to make long trips on the bicycles to visit churches and just to help them and to teach them the word of God. In those days, though, there was also a war going on in China. And sometimes you go to a village that had just been burned by soldiers. Many people are being killed. But in that situation, Eric would go and he would just bring the comfort of God's word into the villages where there was much suffering and much pain. And then... Not long afterwards, there was uh, an invasion. Before that happened, Eric, he got his wife and family now to go back home to uh, Canada and, um, and, and Scotland. And then when Eric, he had gone back with him for a while and he came back, he found the fountain was much worse. And then at that time, the Japanese soldiers came and he was arrested and he was put in a prison camp. And during that time, Eric, he often went hungry and it was very difficult. But the people that describe how Eric, even though he was not very well uh, at times, yet he would still spend time with the young people in that prison camp, teaching them games and helping them to get to know about God's love for them. And then, just towards the end of the war, sadly, Eric, he took ill and he had a, a brain tumour. And just before the war finished, sadly, Eric, he died and went to his reward in heaven. I think the last verse, the words that he, he, he told the people, he says how, I know 
I'm surrendered fully to the Lord Jesus. And Eric, in one sense, it was told that he could have been released from prison uh, because the authorities like Church, uh, Churchill, Winston Churchill, apparently they, they sought to get Eric released. And he could have been released, but there was someone else he felt who needed this special pardon. And so he said, no, no, don't release me, release this person. And so he put somebody else before him where he could have probably been released early. So that's just a very short story of Eric Little. He, as you know, is a very famous missionary. And um, this was his, his verse that he used from the Bible. I've got here, whoops. And... This was what he, uh, a verse from the book of Philippians, where he said, uh, No, dear brothers and sisters, I'm not achieved it by focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward or reaching forward to what lies ahead. He says, I press on to reach the end of the race and reach the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. And he knew the Christian life is like a race. and so he sought to uh, put God first in every day did and, and follow the instructions that God has given to us in his word to love other people, to think more highly of them than we do of ourselves and to seek to be able to serve. And that's what he did. He did a tremendous thing. We all know him for the amazing race that he did in the Olympics in 1924. But we can also remember him for his faithfulness to God and how we love God and served him with all of our heart. And that's the main thing, because as we said, there was all those spectators in heaven, almost from the stand, waving him on. And I believe he won the race, the heavenly race, where he triumphed for the Lord and he, as we showed with our with our uh, little illustration with Chester this morning, he was able to become one of God's precious jewels, just like God wants you to be as well. All oh, that special jewel that you are to be. OK, let's just have one more song and then we're going to have a look at our special Bible story today. So let's just find our song. My mouse isn't working very well as well again. Today. Ah, here it is. Okay, and uh, there we go. Okay, now you say you saw this before. When we read the Bible, it's good to ask ourselves these three questions. And if we can do that, when we read a passage from the Bible, which is very important for us to do, it's, it's three questions we can say, what does the Bible, what is it saying? So we read a passage from the Bible. So we read it, in the Old Testament, New Testament, what does it say? And then we try to think, well, what does it mean? And sometimes, as we know, there are many Bible guides that we can have. But sometimes when we just read the Bible, the Bible tells us, or Jesus tells us, the Holy Spirit he comes and he helps us understand. So we can ask the Holy Spirit who lives within us when we receive Jesus. We ask the Holy Spirit to show us what God wants us to know. So a little chorus just goes like this. It goes, when I read God's word each day, I will ask myself three questions. What does it say? What does it mean? What is God saying to me? I will ask the Holy Spirit, who lives within my heart, to show me the answers clearly, so I'll know God's answer to me. One more time. When I read God's word each day, I will ask myself three questions. What does it say? What does it mean? What is God saying to me? I will ask God's Holy Spirit, who lives within my heart, to show me the answers clearly, so I'll know God's answer to me. And we can do that just as we come into our Bible reading today or our Bible story. We can just say and we say, Lord, what 
does this passage tell us? What does it mean? And what are you saying to us today? And today, it's wonderful that God speaks to us through his word. That's where we share God's word. God himself, he shows us, speaks into our heart. He speaks unto understanding and he helps us understand the truth and how it can apply to us in our lives. Well, if you've been with us before in the last couple of weeks, you know we've been doing the story of uh, the story of the prophets. And we've been doing, first of all, we did the story here of Elijah. And uh, last week, we went very, very quickly. I'll just mention this. You can, if you are watching, remember the story of Elijah, how God told Elijah to tell King Ahab, Queen Jezebel was going to be no rain because of the wickedness and the evil they were doing, the worshipping of false gods and causing people to do lots of sin. And so Elijah told them there was going to be no rain. And during that time, while there was no rain, he was fed by the ravens in a wonderful way. And when the brook dried up, God told him to go to a place called Zarephath, where he had this lady who was going to look after him and feed him. And God supernaturally fed them with uh, each day the cruise of oil and the food she had every day came, multiplied, because God had made a promise he would look after them. And that's what happened during that time too. That was the food. The son of the lady, he died and Elijah prayed. And the Lord brought the child back to life again. It was a wonderful story, a tremendous story. This, if you've not read that, you weren't with us last week. And then finally, God told Elijah to go back to King Ahab and tell him there was going to come rain. But there was a contest and they had to go before the people and decide who the true God really was. Whether it's this Moloch, this statue that they would worship or the true and the living God who had created all things. And so there was this contest and the true contest was going to be the prophet of Baal would put a bull upon the altar and Elijah would do the same. And the God who answered by fire, they, that was going to be the true God. So they, that was the scripture. The prophets of Baal went first and they jumped and all kinds of things calling upon their God. Of course, he was a false God. He wasn't a true God. And so nothing happened. And then Elijah came and he realized he was trusting God, that God would keep his word and his promise. He knew that if God didn't send him fire, he would die. Well, he prayed. And of course, the main thing he wanted was that the people's hearts would be turned back towards God. That was what he wanted. Many people to turn their lives back to God. Well, he prayed. And as you know, the story God sent down fire from heaven and it was just an amazing, amazing victory for the Lord. And the people says, yes, the Lord, he is the true God. And they decided indeed that they would follow him. And the prophets of Baal, the wicked prophets were punished. God told Ahab, uh, Elijah told Ahab that there was going to be rain. And yet at that time there was no rain. So he prayed with his servant to go to the top of a hill and see if there's any clouds. And during that time, Elijah went and he prayed, nothing, but he prayed. The Bible tells us he prayed seven times. And then on the seventh time, his servant came back and he says, Elijah, I see a cloud like a man's hand. And Elijah realized that he had answered his prayer and there was going to be rain. So he told Ahab, quickly, you get on your chariot. And there's a sound of rain and there was it poured down poured down just like we're having storms around us just now well so that was the story and he went all the way from Mount Carmel back to Jezreel and Elijah ran before the chariot exuberantly and uh, triumphant and yet and what we're going to do um, now I'm going to show you something and this story is not often told. It's a story that happened next. And 
I've got some new illustrations here for you just to have a look at. The when now this is the illustrations now when it, King Ahab got back to Jezreel there was his wife asking and finding out what had been going on and she was furious absolutely she was absolutely furious at what she heard and especially how Elijah had slain all the prophets with the sword so Jezebel instead of being oh this is terrible we need to uh, repent and, 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 and cry out to God for mercy which is really what she should have done now this lady was very very wicked and very evil so she sent a message to Elijah and she says right she says so let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as a life of one of them by tomorrow about this time in other words she sent a message to Elijah who was now pretty exhausted about all that he'd done you know sometimes when we serve God and do different things it is draining we can get really tired we can see God do wonderful things and then we can be exhausted afterwards and Elijah was pretty exhausted almost had done the running it, 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 it oh it called down the fire and everything else but now he was drained drained physically but also drained spiritually and so when Jezebel sent this message that she was going to get him killed Elijah instead of crying out to God and saying God Lord you're the Lord he was exhausted and it was like the Bible tells us about having a shield of faith to protect us from arrows that the devil puts into us to make us discouraged and afraid because that's what the devil wants us to do he wants to put we would call it a spirit of fear into our hearts where we fear the things that people are saying where they say things which are not according to God's word and we begin to listen to them then we listen to God's word and always for you and I uh, as Christians we are to hold on to what God's word says and not by what if God's word says something very different to what other people are saying what are we going to trust are we going to trust God's word are we going to trust what people are saying now Jezebel said I'm going to kill you and he thought oh no she's going to kill me but if he'd realized but he forgot just for that time he forgot that God was with him that God would protect him and look after him and he forgot that and when we forget God's word that's when fear comes in and we get very very discouraged and so the Bible tells us that when that happened Elijah he went with his servant and they went a day's journey and went as far away as he possibly could and uh, he sat down under a tree a tree and as he did that he went all the way from where he was Jezreel Samaria it's a long way right down here to a place called Bathsheba and when he got there he told his servant to wait and he went and he came and he slept down I went down by this tree and he prayed and he requested he says Lord it's enough it's enough Lord I've had it please I just want to die and if you like Elijah had what we call was a pity party yes <laughs> have you ever had a pity party where you say oh it's terrible I haven't got a job what's going to happen I can't do this work now um oh dear I have no job and, um, and my friends don't want to be friends anymore and I can't do this I have no money oh what's going to happen I know my family are all upset with me and they don't want to speak to me and 
all kinds of things and we can have what we call a pity party because it seems as though everything is against us and at times in our lives that's how it can be people can uh, not want to be our friends uh, our people that we've trusted in can let us down and we can run out of money and our health is struggling and we think oh dear and many people can be like Elijah and say Lord I'd much rather go to heaven just now this is so difficult well he lay down after making this kind of prayer to God uh, and then as Elijah laid down there it is as you can see him there the Bible says an angel came and an angel touched him and says Elijah get up and eat and then he looked probably the angel disappeared at that point it, it was like the angel had made him food made him some bread and uh, some water and Elijah oh that's very nice and so he eat and then he again laid down again in other words he wasn't responding to what this provision that God had made for him meant it was almost oh yeah that was nice God helped me then but oh no I still want to die really but immediately as he laid down again the angel came the second time and touched him and said now arise and eat because you need this food because the journey that you're going on unless you eat it will be too great for you so Elijah he then rose and he ate his special food and it was very special food that God had provided for him and this food gave him the strength to go on a journey of 40 days and 40 nights onto a mountain called Mount Horeb which is another name for the Mount Sinai is called the Mount of God. Sometimes it's called Mount Musa, the mountain of Moses. And Elijah, he went to this place, as you can see, it was a long way, the journey that he had come right down here. And this is where the picture, as you can see, it is. This is uh, Israel, of course, is uh, up here. There's what we call the Sinai Peninsula, and Israel is up there where, and so it was a long journey. Elijah had come right down here, as it were, 40 days, 40 nights. It took him uh, to get here to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, and he climbed up this mountain. And as he climbed up, he came into a cave, and he began to live in this cave and as he was there God's word came to him and the Lord says to him what are you doing here Elijah and Elijah says Lord I have been I've been serving you I've been very earnest and passionate in serving you because the children of Israel have turned away from you they pulled down your altars they have slain your prophets and Lord, it's like I'm the only one left and they're going to try and kill me as well. And then the Lord says to him, Elijah, go to the entrance of the cave and stand upon the mount and the mountain. And then the Lord passed by and there was a great wind which tore the mountains and the rocks began to fall before him. But then, even though God was showing these signs, the presence of God was not in these things. God was showing him these signs and there was a tremendous wind. And then after the wind, there was an earthquake. But there were all these signs, but the presence of the Lord wasn't in these signs. And then after the wind and the earthquake and the rocks were falling the, and the fire, all of these were demonstrations of God's power and God shows his mighty power. He controls the storms and the weather and the winds and everything. He is in control. And when we cry out to him, he can alter things as we turn to him. Yes, we're to look after 
our physical recreation, which is a lot of people are saying this is very important as we as they, they use the term climate change. But often God uses these things to help us to understand we need to turn back to him. And the Bible explains that when we turn back to God, he heals our land and he can store things as it was meant to be. Well, all these were signs and demonstrations, but God wasn't in there. And then, as Elijah then was quiet in the cave, there came a still small voice. And once again, now the Lord spoke to him and says, Elijah. And Elijah heard the still small voice of the Lord. What are you doing here? And Elijah again began to explain what had happened that he felt he was the only person left and the lord told him no no you're not the only person and uh, i have still got a job for you to do and so god gave him instructions that he was to leave mount sinai and mount horeb and he was to anoint new kings and he was also to call somebody to take his place as the prophet of the Lord. So in one sense, Elijah was getting his wish to go home to be with the Lord because God was going to replace him. And um, and also God explained, look, Elijah, you're not on your own. There are over 7,000 others who have not bowed their knees um, to these false gods. So Elijah, do what I want you to do. So Elijah did that and the Bible tells us he left the mountain, the Mount Horeb, and he went down to choose and call Elijah. Now, what I was just showing you pictures of here, this is the pictures of Mount Horeb and the mountain where Elijah was. And a few years ago, I had the opportunity to go to these places, and it was amazing. And I was with a friend and we camped on top of Mount Sinai, just below the bottom. And I remember coming out of my tent and looking in the skies, which was just like that, that picture there. And I remember the words that the Lord had says to Elijah, what are you doing here? And I thought, oh Lord, what am I doing here? But it was so good just to climb up that mountain, up Mount Sinai. And to be in the place where God spoke to Moses and God spoke to Elijah. A very, very special place. And uh, sometimes it's just so good as we can consider, as we see there, the heavens and all the things that God has made. And how God, for each of us, has got a special job for all of us. This is a special job for you. So Elijah now was to go and do what God had said. And to go, just very quickly do this, he went down and uh, back into the territory which was ruled by Jezebel and he called this man, here he is, called Elisha and he came and he put in what we call his mantle which is like his coat, which is a sign of his authority. He put his mantle on Elijah and said, Elijah, you know, to follow me and off he went. And so Elijah, I said, first of all, let me go and, and, and tell my family and then I will come and follow you. And Elijah says, OK. And so what um, Elisha did, he went and told his family, he killed and uh, killed the oxen. And in other words, he, he showed that he was going to leave the life he was now living. And he was going to do what Elijah said. And then he turned and he began to follow Elisha. And next week, when we come to our story, we will uh, find out a little bit more how Elijah was taken into heaven in a dramatic way. And how that anointing that was on Elijah came upon Elisha. In fact, with the Bible calls it a double portion because that's what Elisha recognized in need. He knew that to do what Elijah did, he then he would need so much more of the strength that Elijah had. And actually, 
God gave it to him. But we'll find out more about that next week. But the important thing is, remember, you are a special jewel who God has chosen to follow him. We can be many different types of jewels, but we're all incredibly precious to God. And I believe this, that if you were the only person living on this earth, the Lord Jesus would have come and would have died for you because you are precious to him. And that's the important thing. That we were willing to come, as Jesus calls us, to do what Jesus did. And maybe if you've been a bit discouraged, sometimes it is tough being a Christian. But as we're thinking about an athlete, and we thought about Eric Liddell, not giving up, not going to give up. No, I'm going to follow Jesus in his strength and ask him to help us. So the question is, as we finish today is, are you following Jesus? First of all, are you a true Christian? Have you asked Jesus into your life and are you willing to follow him? But then maybe you got a bit discouraged. Maybe you're thinking it's so difficult, it's so tough. The Lord wants to come to you and says, come on, get yourself up. Don't give up. Come on, follow me. Get back into the Bible. Get back reading the word. Get back praising me. Get back going to your church. Don't give up. Never, never give up. Because the Lord is with you and he will help you. So let's pray. And as we pray today, as we normally do at the end of our, our service, if you're not a Christian and you'd like to accept Jesus into your life, why don't you just say this prayer with me? And simply pray and say, Lord Jesus, I ask you today to forgive me for all I've done wrong, to come and live in my heart. Lord Jesus, give me the strength and the power of your Holy Spirit so I can follow you. And if you've been a bit discouraged, just ask the Lord today and say, Lord, I know I've been not following you as I should. I have been a bit upset. It's been difficult. It's been tough. But today, Lord Jesus, I ask you to help me to follow you and serve you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for loving me. Thank you, you're holding me by my hand and you're not going to let me go. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, thanks for looking in and the Lord bless you. Have a good week and God willing, see you next week. Bye.